Have you ever known someone that just uh, can never stop talking about themselves? You know, if, if they do anything, everybody's got to know. They got to make sure they get credit from it from everybody. And uh, a- any good traits they have, they just have to highlight them. And it, it just it seems like everything uh, about them has to be uh, revealed to everyone around them all the time. You have a high opinion of someone like that? Not typically, right? We usually think somebody like that's probably uh, vain or maybe really insecure, and it, it doesn't really make us think well of them. So, so if that's how we think about a people that are always talking about themselves, what do we make of the fact that when we open up God's word, he does a whole lot of talking about himself? I mean, why is it so important to God to tell us all about him? Why does God care what we think about him? Is he insecure? Is he vain? Or is there something else going on here? That's what we want to consider this morning as we continue our series in the book of Psalms that we're calling Songs for the Soul. So far, we've looked at Psalm 1. Last week, we looked at Psalm 46. And today, we're going to look at that psalm that Judy read for us, Psalm 19. Uh, For those that have been asking, next week is going to be Psalm 73, uh, and then we'll do Psalm 51 and Psalm 8 the two weeks after that. But this morning we have Psalm 19. It is a psalm of David. Uh, Most of us know uh, or are familiar with who David was in the Bible. He was king of Israel, but before that he was a shepherd. God raised him up to become king miraculously and did some incredible things in his life, but he also suffered great hardship. And uh, he also committed some great sin along the way. And yet, probably the defining trait of David is the passion that he had for his relationship with God. And I think you'll see that show up as we look at this psalm together. But uh, let's go ahead and, and dive in. We're calling our message this morning, Rejoicing in Revelation. David is celebrating the fact that God does reveal himself to us, that we do, we can know some things about God because of how God has chosen to communicate with us. Um, If you haven't done so already, I encourage you, if you've got a Bible this morning, to turn to Psalm 19. Uh, I'm going to be using that same translation that Judy read for us, NIV, but you can follow along in your own preferred translation. Let's start by looking at the first three and a half verses here. Uh, verses 1 through 4a. David writes, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. David is rejoicing in the way that God is revealed in creation. Specifically here, he's focusing on the sky, right? We see that Hebrew parallelism. He talks about the heavens and the skies, two different words for the same thing. He's he's imagining somebody looking up at the night sky, or as we'll see here in a minute, even the the daytime sky, and and marveling at, at that creation. And he tells us that that creation tells us something about God. God is revealing himself in it. This is what theologians will often refer to as general revelation or natural revelation, right? Anybody living in God's creation can understand something about God by looking at creation. So David tells us that even though there's no words being spoken, it reveals something about God. It it, it tells us something about who he is. To give us a little clearer picture of what we might conclude about God, David gives a specific example in uh, the second half of verse 4 through verse 6. Look at this with me. It says, in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. 
David uses two poetic metaphors here to describe the sun. Okay? He's not giving an astronomy lesson on, on the nature and movement of planets. Okay? He's describing what it's like to live in a world with a sun like the one God has provided for us. And the first metaphor he uses is the sun coming forth like a bridegroom. You can anticipate, you can imagine a, a wedding, right? They're there to celebrate the, the marriage that's about to happen. And, and in that Jewish tradition, the, it's, instead of having the bride come down the aisle, it was the bridegroom that would arrive, that would um, si signify the beginning of the wedding ceremony. And the joy, uh, the anticipation that's being released in that moment of the bridegroom's arrival. He says, when the sun comes forth, it's like that. Because think about it. How much do we need the sun? We should be celebrating the fact that the sun came up this morning. It should be as big a deal to us as it is for that bridegroom to show up at the wedding. He also compares the sun to a champion runner. And you can imagine uh, one of these distance runners, right? They run a marathon or some of them run these ultra marathons. The, you know, distances that are, that are unfathomable to most of us. But he says, where does the sun run? The sun runs from one end of the sky to the other and he does it every single day. What a feat. What a miracle. What a marvelous accomplishment God has put before us every day single day and this is a gift from god the sun of course is just one example we could talk about the rain and the rivers that flow and and um, all the different ways that god has blessed us but just looking at the sun it tells us something about the goodness of god and, and the fact that this goodness is available to everyone no one is deprived of the sun's warmth god doesn't pick out his special favorites and let the sun shine on them no everybody benefits everybody is blessed God's faithfulness is also on display, right? None of us woke up this morning anxious about whether the sun was going to rise. Because we knew it was going to happen. Not because of our advanced understanding of uh, planetary movements and gravitational forces, but because it has risen every day for our entire lives. The consistency, the faithfulness of the laws of nature tell us something about the God of nature and his consistency and faithfulness. David is telling us that we should be able to get a glimpse of who God is, his majesty, his power, his glory, and his character simply by observing the natural world. And not just us, but everyone has the opportunity to draw that conclusion. That's a key concept for us this morning. God's majesty and character are revealed to everyone in his creation. It's what we refer, refer to as general or natural revelation. God has been revealed to everybody. And yet we know that not everybody has a proper understanding of God, right? Throughout history, many cultures have come up with stories and, and explanations for the obvious supernatural presence in the universe that doesn't look very much like the God of the Bible. Today, we have the phenomenon of, of atheists saying, well, these natural laws just exist as natural laws, and we don't know where they came from or why they're so consistent, but there's no need to believe in a God that is faithful just because the universe that happens to exist around us randomly is completely consistent and faithful. So we can draw some pretty wrong conclusions despite natural revelation. So we need something else, don't we? We need God to go a little bit further in revealing himself to us. And he has done that. And, and David celebrates that in these next verses. Look at verses 7 and 8. He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. This is another example in these verses of what we've already talked about is a, a key feature in Hebrew poetry, parallelism. The same idea being restated in two, or in this case, four ways. 
David uses four different words to describe God's special revelation, the word of God. He refers to it as the law of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, and the commands of the Lord. And then in each of these statements, he tells us something about the nature of God's word and something about what God's word does. Look at how God's word is described. It is perfect. It is trustworthy. It is right. And it is radiant. You notice how those same adjectives could be applied to God himself? His nature, his character is revealed in the nature and the character of his special revelation of his word. But going beyond how David describes natural revelation, we see that there are specific goals involved in our encounter with God's word. It's supposed to do something for us. He tells us it's re, uh, refreshing the soul. He tells us it's, it's making wise the simple. It's giving joy to the heart. It's giving light to the eyes. We need God's word to, to experience that, that fresh life when the broken world we live in has us beaten down. To, to help us fully experience the joy of living in God's creation. Simply looking around doesn't always do it, but God's word can bring joy to our heart. It gives light to the eyes so that we can see the truth, so that we can understand the way the word, uh, the world is really supposed to be. It makes wise the simple. It corrects our errors and our confusion. Verse 9 breaks the pattern a little bit, but continues the theme. Here he talks about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord isn't necessarily speaking of God's word directly, but if we fear the Lord, we will obey his word. So the implication here is that we need to act upon that word. We're told that it is pure when we do that and that it, like God, it endures forever. And then we're told one more time, another, uh, another noun here describing God's uh, special revelation, the ordinance of the Lord. But here we have two descriptions of the nature of God's word, that it is firm and that all of the, his words are righteous. So David celebrates, rejoices in God's special revelation, the unique character that it has, the benefits that it can bring. Not only does it bring benefit, but it is a true, rich blessing. Look at verses 10 and 11. Speaking of God's special revelation, the words of God, he says, uh, beginning in verse 10, they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them is your servant warm, warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. God's word is true. It is reliable it gives us an accurate picture of who god is but it is also intended to be a blessing it's not just so that god has good pr in the world right? it's meant to enrich us it's meant to bless us god wants us to enjoy our experience of his word of his special revelation just as his blessing and his benevolent nature is on display in the natural world in natural revelation so it is in God's word, in his special revelation, when we obey it, right? Where does the great reward come from? It comes in keeping God's word. We have to do something with it, but the intent is that we will. The intent is that we will listen. The intent is that it will have an impact on us and that we will be blessed as a result. So if you take that general sense we get from natural revelation that there's a good creator God out there and that he's uh, majestic and powerful and faithful like the nature of his universe and then we add the more specific and detailed description of who God is and how he works and, and his love for us and how he's worked throughout history to draw people to himself, we have a much closer connection to God and we can experience his blessings uh, more fully. And yet, David seems to understand that even that special revelation, even that amazing gift by itself, doesn't always get us to where we need to be. And so we read in verses 12 and 13, who can discern their own errors? 
And then he prays to God, forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. David wants to be blameless. He wants to be innocent. He wants to be pure. And he has access to general revelation. And he has access to special revelation. And yet he acknowledges that even with all of that, he can't get there on his own. He says, look, nobody can actually see their own sin. We all have a blind spot when it comes to self-reflection. And, and he, he asked God to forgive the sins that he's committed. And he also asked God to keep him from sinning. We need God to help us recognize sin. We need God to help us to forgive our sin. And we need God to be able to avoid sinning. It's only then that we can become the innocent, blameless people that God desires us to be. Now, God's word plays a role in that, but sometimes we get a little bit mixed up about how that works. If you grew up in church, you may have grown up doing sword drills. You know what a sword drill is, right? You close your Bible and they, they give you a reference and you turn to it and you read it real fast, right? Because um, this is the sword of the spirit. And, and that's a great way to help familiarize kids with the Bible. And, and kids love the idea. I think we all like the idea that, uh, of God's word being a sword, being a weapon, right? But if you're like me, I think sometimes we imagine that we're the one wielding the weapon of God's word, right? Doing God's work in the world, wielding his word. But nowhere in the Bible is this called the sword of the Christian or the sword of the scholar. Whose sword is it? It's the Holy Spirit's sword. And we love that verse in, in Hebrews 4.12 that describes the word of God as being living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. But you've got to keep reading because who gets stabbed? It's me, the reader. The word of God is powerful when it is wielded by God. But it is absolutely possible for us to come to God's word and, and try and take control of it ourselves and not experience the benefits and the blessings of it. See, God reveals himself in creation through natural revelation. He reveals himself in his word through special revelation, but he also reveals himself in a third way, in the most important way, in the absolutely essential way. He reveals himself personally through personal revelation. And when we look at the story of the Bible, we see God doing that periodically in the Old Testament when he appears to Moses, when he appears to Abraham, when he goes before his people in a cloud and in a pillar of fire, his personal presence is there. And yet his people failed over and over again. That glimpse of a personal connection with God wasn't enough. And so then God chose to reveal himself personally in the most mind-blowing way imaginable. God the Son became a human being. Jesus Christ Fully God and fully man, a mystery that we cannot entirely comprehend. And he lived the kind of life that we were designed to live. God personally became one of us, walked among us, lived around us, ministered to us. And knowing that we are incapable of overcoming sin and death that has become our master because of our legacy through Adam and Eve and because of each of our own decisions at times to do things our way instead of God's way. Jesus went to the cross and died in our place to pay the debt that we couldn't pay. And he rose again, conquering sin and death so that through that personal revelation, we could have a right relationship with God. And then when he ascended to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit. And God's personal revelation resides in everyone who has trusted in Jesus. Now, sometimes we don't hear him so good because we're shouting him down with our own pride and our own agenda, our own sin. We can quench the spirit, but he's there. He's available. And by the way, he's not just available to me in my heart. He's available to me in your heart if he lives in you. 
And so God calls us to live in community so that his personal revelation can be present in his people around us. His personal revelation is what takes that general revelation and that special revelation and actually achieves the purpose of that revelation. And that's the second key concept for us. God's word only changes us when it's accompanied by God's presence in our lives. There are men and women who dedicate their lives to studying the scriptures that have no relationship with God. And to them, the word of God is interesting and it might have some wisdom. They might even take some of those principles and apply it and, and figure out how to have a better marriage or a better business and, and, and get something out of it. But it's not more precious than gold. It's not sweeter than honey from the honeycomb. Because it is only when God's personal presence is part of our experience of his word that it truly has the impact that it's intended to have on our lives. When God's natural revelation and special revelation are accompanied by God's personal revelation, it transforms us in a way that is encapsulated so beautifully in the final verse of this psalm. Look at Psalm 1914 with me. David concludes the psalm with this prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's so rich. There's so much there. D David is acknowledging two aspects of life. The words of my mouth represents what's external, right? It's what comes out of the heart. And I think it's not a stretch to assume that that would include other external aspects of our lives, right? The deeds that we do, not just the words that we speak. Because if the words of our mouth reflect what's going on in our heart, certainly the way that we choose to live, the choices we make in life do. But it's not just the external that David is concerned with. He's also concerned with the meditation of my heart. But how does he want these to be transformed? What is the basis for, for this change that he wants? We, he's talked about sin, but he doesn't just say, let me be sinless, let me be pure, let me be cleansed, let me be righteous. No, he wants them to be pleasing in God's sight. See, there's a relational focus there, isn't there? David wants to be the kind of man that pleases God because he wants to be in a relationship with God. His desire to be changed isn't just to be the best version of himself. It's to be the version of himself that draws him close to the Lord. I love that relational focus. He wants it to be pleasing in God's sight. God reveals himself because he wants us to be pleasing in his sight because he wants us to have that relationship with him. And by the way, even as David prays this prayer, he recognizes that God needs to be part of this from beginning to end, right? He says, oh Lord, my rock, my foundation, the thing on which my entire life should be built and my redeemer, the one who's going to rescue and redeem all the mistakes, all the sins that I've committed and will commit in the future, beginning to end, God has to be part of it. David wants to be transformed by the revelation of God. He wants the truth about God on display in the natural world. He wants the truth about God so eloquently described in his word to transform his, David's heart. This is is the true purpose of revelation. This is the big idea of our message. God reveals himself to us so that we can be transformed through relationship with him. God talks about himself, not because he needs us to love him, but, but because we need to love him in order to become the people we were meant to become. We were created to be in relationship with God. And we can't be in relationship with God if we don't know him. And we can't know him if he doesn't reveal himself. But the goal of that revelation is always that we would be transformed through relationship with him. We should rejoice in God's revelation. But we should always keep in mind that the purpose is relational transformation. 
It's impossible to know someone without knowing some true things about them, right? If I introduce you to somebody and say, hey, this is my best friend, Bob. But I don't know where Bob lives or what he does for a living, where he went to school, where he grew up. Can't remember what, his, what color his eyes are. It's not much of a relationship there, right? Th that knowledge, that correct true knowledge is an aspect of relation. Now, I don't need to know everything about Bob to have a relationship with him. But the more I have a relationship with him, the more I know Bob, the more I'm going to want to know about Bob. A and if I have a good relationship with him, what I know about him is going to be true, mostly at least. I might get a few details wrong. But that, that knowledge about is part of that knowledge of, right? But it's also possible to have knowledge about someone without knowing them at all, right? I could read a biography on somebody. I could hire a private investigator to, to follow you around and give me all the details on your life, and I could read a report, and I could know a whole lot about you. It doesn't mean I have any relationship with you at all. See, if we're not careful, we can allow our engagement of God's revelation to help us know about God. And we can rejoice in knowing about God and all the facts that we have and our correct theology and the verses we can quote without actually knowing God. The reason God wants us to know about Him is so that we know Him. And he would much rather have us know a little bit less about him and know him relationally better if we had to choose between the two. They go together. You can't have a relationship with God without some true knowledge about him. But the goal is to know him. And here's the thing. If you really know him, you will be changed by him. It is possible to study the, the natural universe and physics and, and all the amazing things about God's creation and to be truly impressed and to even maybe make some conclusions about the, the nature and character of someone that might create a universe like that. It is impossible to have all of that knowledge and not be changed at the heart level. It is possible to study God's word and learn Hebrew and Greek and diagram sentences and do all the background studies and have the, a nearly perfect exegetical understanding of God's word and not be changed at all, except in your mind. But it is impossible to truly have a relationship with Jesus to truly allow the Holy Spirit to be present in your life, to speak into your life. It is impossible to know God personally in an intimate way and not be changed by Him. If your encounter with God's revelation does not lead to transformation, then you might know about God, but you don't know God. And that is the goal. A relationship that will actually change us so how do we get there how do we engage with god's revelation in a way that will lead to transformation i think there's three things we should keep in mind first of all we should rejoice in god's revelation in all three forms of it it's great to go out in nature and marvel at the beauty of god's creation it's great to, to, to study physics or, or geography and, and just be blown away by the God who could create this universe. It's wonderful to study the Bible and to learn about who God is and how he's worked with his people throughout history. Those are all good things. And we should rejoice in those. We should enjoy those. We should celebrate those. But the second point is that we should engage that revelation in ways that enhance our relationship with God. If you love being out in nature and you just go out in nature because it's beautiful and it's relaxing and it's peaceful, but you don't come away feeling any closer to God, then you're not really getting out of natural revelation what God wants you to get out of it. If you go to Bible study or come to church on a Sunday morning and your understanding has expanded and you can answer more 
theological questions correctly, but you're not closer to Jesus? You missed the point. We have to look for the ways, and this might look different for different people, right? But we have to look for the ways that are actually going to enhance our personal connection to the Lord, that are actually going to enhance our relationship with Him. Because that's the whole point of Revelation. God wants you to know Him. And so He tells you about Himself. But if that about doesn't get to the relationship, then you're doing it wrong. So don't evaluate your Bible study or, or, or your time uh, out in nature based on how much you've accomplished, how much you know, how you feel in the moment. Based on, base it on whether or not you're growing closer to Jesus as a result. And the best way to tell whether you're growing closer to Jesus is to ask myself, is Psalm 1914 starting to describe me more? Are the words of my mouth and the actions of my life and the meditations of my heart becoming more pleasing to God? Am I recognizing the reality that God is both my rock and my redeemer? Is that becoming more and more true of me? Because if that's not happening, I... I have to say you're probably not really connecting in relationship with god because vital relationship with god will change us so we have to embrace that the goal of all of this is personal transformation through relationship with god not through willpower not through self-help books through relationship with god but that relationship will lead to transformation and if the transformation isn't happening then the revelation isn't doing its job God reveals himself to us, and that's wonderful. We should celebrate that. We should rejoice, but he reveals himself to us for a reason, and it's so that we can be changed by a relationship with him, so that we can be transformed by actually knowing him. When you go out and you look at the sky this week, when you open your Bible this week, when you talk to a Christian friend about the Lord this week, rejoice in God's revelation. But understand the purpose is for you to be changed. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this psalm. We thank you for how focused David was on his relationship with you. Through all the ups and downs, through all his failures, he never lost sight of that. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself in the world and in creation. We thank you that you have revealed yourself through your word. We thank you that you revealed yourself in the person of Jesus Christ and in your Holy Spirit that is present not only in our hearts, but in the hearts of your people that you've surrounded us with. And we pray that as we engage with your revelation, that we would come to not just know about you, but to truly know you and that you would begin to change our hearts. God, we pray together this morning. May the meditations of our hearts May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be ever pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.